Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Bill Merchant, Deputy Director for Collections, Historian and Curator here at the DNH Canal Historical Society, and I want to thank you for joining me here for Sunday Afternoons with our historian. I'm all alone this time. My camera person's deserted me, uh, at least for today. But uh, that's okay, because you won't need to look at me, because we're going to be looking at some really wonderful artwork here. Anybody who's studied the DNH Canal has to know this book, Coal Boats to Tidewater. And this book was the work of a fascinating man, Manville Wakefield. Wake, as I'm told uh, he's known. Um, and it, he took some 10 years to write this book. Uh, Manville Wakefield was a Sullivan County historian uh, and an art instructor at uh, Sullivan County Community College. And of, and of course, uh, uh, fans of, of Wakes are going to be here today. He was a fascinating man. His widow, Barbara Wakefield Purcell, tells me that they were just driving along one day and he saw the remains of something and he got out of the car, stopped, and that started his love of the DNH Canal. This is a book from my private collection. It'll wind up at the collection here. We probably have five or six, seven or eight copies of this book. I have two signed copies. This is a very typical ins inscription with best wishes for a pleasant ride down the old DNH Canal, Manville Wakefield. An amazing book. Uh, and we're fortunate enough here at the Canal Society to have a lot of Manville Wakefield's um, collection. We have ephemera that he's collected, we have the pictures, and we have a lot of the marvelous artwork that he created for this book. So some of the stuff that we'll be seeing in here, you'll be seeing the original. Let me see if I can find you a good one here, one I know will do. There we go, That's, we'll see this at some point. Um, and, and virtually everything we're looking at today, well, no, it's a, it's a combination, it's a combination. So one of the things he did was just stuff like this. Hey, Judy, how are you doing? Genius me or Manville? Uh, I'm sorry, it's definitely Manville. Uh, he really was, and you know, he died in his 50s. That man accomplished, I am in awe of what that man accomplished. He really, um, in, a, in a short time, he, he, uh, he accomplished an awful lot. So this is uh, one of his drawings of a lower, how the lock operated. So the DNH canal, most canals used, uh, uh, had two, two lock tenders, um, one on each side, and they had to operate these miter gate handles. So you'd have to have a guy on this side and a guy on the other side where the other miter gate was. Uh, both of these are drawings that came from his, uh, that, that wound up in his book. You can see this one's actually uh, um, missing some of its uh, uh, pieces. While these are out, I think I'll try and take a little bit of time. I think is that, that, that might belong there. Uh, you can see that the old glue didn't, uh, didn't last here. Um, and by the way, for you younger people, what we're looking at here is artwork that was created for his book in the age before computers. Today, all this would be done on a computer, but it, as you can see here, there's various things that had to be pasted uh, he would have had this type typeset by somebody and printed and pasted it all together and it was all laid up. And very often these things have got um, notes on them as to where they're going to belong and stuff. Uh, but so the early locks, uh, when they opened at 18, well, they were operating in 1828 until about 1853, needed two lock tenders and they had to have a guy on each side. The miter gate invented by Leonardo da Vinci um, in the... Uh, 15th century, I guess, maybe 16th century. Um, and a Meyer gate is the idea where the, the, the pressure, so that the, instead of the gates going like this, they're at an angle, and then the pressure of the water on this side will, will keep those gates closed. But, uh, but, you know, they had 108 locks, 110 locks at this point on the d &H Canal, so they had some 220 people to operate their, their locks. But between 1853 and 1857, and we'll see here, this is some new scholarship. It says in use after 1850, but in fact, this particular patented part, it was semi-patented. This end was, has a patent, which we have a copy of in our office, um, enabled one person to, to close one set of miter gates. They had to use a drop gate on the other side. Um, 
So here's, here's Wake. Uh, he didn't have the source or the easy source. I can say definitively now it was between 1853 and 1857 because of testimony in the 1858 court case between Pennsylvania Coal and the D&H Canal Company. Um, as part of the testimony, Chief Engineer Russell Farnham Lord, um, all the books said 1865, but in fact, um, in, in, in fact, uh, uh, it was between 1853 and 1857 that they converted all 100, at that point, 108 locks to this single lock tender um, thing. And if you ever, when we're open again, we have a working lock model that demonstrates this exact thing. Uh, yes, Bob, he was a master with scratchboard media. This particular image is just uh, pen and ink. But the next ones I'll show you then, just for, uh, in fact, actually, uh, that's a scratch board there. So that first, that second one I showed you is scratch board art. Uh, and that's where, where there's a black media underneath the white and you scratch through with a, 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 a thing and you get these very fine line drawings. What else do we have here we can show you? I just thought when Bob said scratch board art, I should go to it. But first, let me just, uh, once again, we have to, uh, he didn't have uh, easy access to this court case. Uh, I'm in the middle of reading it. It's 5,000 pages. I, you know, it, it, it's, a, it's a, a labor of love on my part, learning some fascinating stuff. Um, but here you've got, as I say, we now know that it's actually between 1827 and 1857 that they finally get them. Uh, oh, thank you for the lock drawing there, Chester. Um, yeah, he was an amazing man too. But, uh, but what else do we have here to show you? So for instance, one of the things that we have here, it's hard to see, but this is notes to whoever was gonna put this thing. Oh yeah, here we go, let's see. Can we read that? This side set. It's all different things so that the people making the book, the way books were made before computers, they'd have to actually shoot plates. So these things would all have to be placed in just the right spot. They typeset the type, but all this, and so that's what this was typeset type. Uh, but then these drawings, and this I believe is a scratch board drawing. Once again, I, there it is, MBW. What's the B stand for, I wonder? Yeah. Um, but the level of detail, some 60 years later, it's great that he had, he was fortunate there were still men alive who were like Du Bois Weber, who actually worked on these boats uh, with their families, uh, very typical of the latter canal period. Um, but so here's a great, uh, great piece of his artwork showing what the boats were like in 1890. So these, were, these boats carried 130 tons of coal. Some of them had a spot on board for the, uh, for the draft animals, typically mules, so that they wouldn't even have to stable them. They could just get on and rest, although sometimes they work those poor mules 24 hours a day. It's an interesting fact that the D&H Canal Company actually had people, um, whether there was a humane society or what, but they policed you. They did not let you mistreat your animals, I, I'm, I'm happy to say. Um, yes, Bob, we are incredibly fortunate, and I get to play with all of it. Uh, excuse me, not play with all of it, but carefully study, and, and in this instance, show you people. Um, you know, the fun thing about me shooting is I get to see your comments, and, and uh, I do so love to talk to the public. And then he had these great, just, and, and all of these drawings I, I was checking this morning show up. Um, he's just got every section of, of uh, some of these just need to get closer, don't they? Just, it's steadier. I, I, I hate that uh, Facebook forces me into um, portrait rather than landscape. See, wouldn't that be nicer if we could look at it that way? But Facebook won't let me. At least if any of you out there know how to, um, let me know. But I haven't figured it out yet. But, you know, we've only been doing this, what, it's maybe we're in our second month here. There's still a lot to learn. I'm going to try and work out um, doing some of my PowerPoint presentations for all you folks. I think I've got that worked out. And, in fact, I'm honored I'll be on the Erie Canal Museum has asked me to do one of my presentations. It'll be on the marginalized population of the DNH. Uh, a week from Thursday, I believe it's June 11th, and then a week from Thursday, and I, I definitely will, uh, will post that when uh, we get a little closer on our Facebook feed, and on my own as well. I'm really kind of proud that they wanted to have me on their platform here. Here's just more of those great, he's just showing you here how that later system worked.
He really, his, his book is full of wonderful, wonderful drawings that he did. I think I'll go over the technical drawings for you now, and then we'll go on to some of the more, even more artistic. And in fact, some of them are framed. We did a uh, seasonal show on the artwork of um, Manville Wakefield. We got his only oil painting uh, of, a, of the canal. He did a lot of railroad scenes. And we showed a lot of our collections. It was a wonderful show. We were fortunate a lot of people who have his other artwork donated it. Uh, and the Sullivan County Community College, hopefully they still have his one canal painting on display in the vestibule or the, the, the main area there. So here he's showing you how, what a boat would look like as it dropped. In the, this isn't as fun as our working lock bottle, but it was his way of showing you in 1965 when his book came out uh, how some of this stuff functioned. Um, Maybe if you live like I did up near Albany, we could still, I remember my parents uh, taking us, we watched a boat go through one of the, one of the working locks on the, on what's, I guess it was up the upper Hudson, wasn't it? I always find it interesting that they, where they show two and three snubbing posts, well, our working lock bottle, I've never seen more than two snubbing posts on any of the locks. That's a good question, Chester. Did the canals or railroads, if you go by his books, I believe to the mountains by rails is afterwards. But if you look at his artwork, he clearly was really interested in railroads. So, I, so now that I think about it, probably he was already interested in railroads because he's got so many more railroad paintings. Um, was much more interested in railroads and then discovered as by that story. Um, To the Mountains by Rail talks about uh, the New York O&W Railway, which in fact, after 1902, um, was extended out of Ellenville all the way up to Kingston, very much on the D&H um, bed. And if you watch our excellent, or I, I say excellent, it's, it's me doing, I love it. Whereas our historian series, I very often, part of what I have to parse and figure out is, gee, what was the, the railroad and what was there when the canal was there? Well, how did they change it? It makes it harder, but uh, but it's sort of fascinating. Uh, please go over to our YouTube channel. We're adding new content, at least one short video, either a tour of our current museum or where is our historian. I fortunately got a lot of um, where of our historian stuff shot before everything leafed out. Boy, it's amazing to me how quickly it gets really hard to see. There's a few sites I'll get to over the summer um, because they won't uh, be bothered, but uh, I'm looking forward to the fall. Uh, I really am not. I'm looking forward to the summer. But in the fall, at least, the one thing I like to say is, boy, I can get out and look at the canal some more, and I'll shoot some more. Where is our historian? But you talk about suitable for framing. These are still, and maybe it's about time, they're, they're properly uh, um, framed. This is actually, there's an airspace you can't see. Um, this is actually on display in our current museum. Um, but here you'll see, this is the Tontine Coffee House. And on January 8th, 1825, the D&H Canal Company opened their, there we go, get that glare out for you. I'm trying, I'm trying to, to, to make it so you can actually see what we're looking at here, people. So like I like to point out over here, this writing in red is telling you where this wants to be. Left-hand page facing beginning chapter number one. And there's, there's lines telling them where to crop it to, I believe. But coffee houses, you know, coffee houses in early history, uh, after coffee became a thing, I, I guess it was the 18th and 19th centuries, coffee houses became a place where people with money could go um, and get investment opportunities. Uh, the stock market had just started. And in fact, um, the New York Stock Exchange had its first board meeting, I believe, in 1823 or 1824 in the boardroom of the Tontine Coffee House. The D&H on April 8th, uh, 1825, opened their stock books. They also had them in Goshen and Kingston. But this was a New York City concern. This company, the, the Wurtz Brothers, get almost just completely taken over by New York City folk. Um, but they opened their stock books, and by proving you could burn anthracite coal, on this cold January day, they oversubscribed their stock. I think they off, it was 1.5 million. In the end, they needed to borrow another half million from the state of New York in 1829. Uh, and I like to laugh at that because that half million dollars financed building the rest of the canal in Pennsylvania. Nothing was dug in Pennsylvania until the final year of construction. So the Tontine Coffee House uh, 
there's a great painting of this in the uh, New York Historical Society in the main, the very first room you walk into there. Uh, maybe we'll have to borrow that for a show sometime or something. But look at that. So this is a scratchboard art. This is where all those fine lines, everything was just from him scratching into the scratchboard. You know, I have to buy me a scratchboard. I'm sure you can still get them. And I'll have to, um, I'll have to play with them. Not that I'm at anything like an artist and certainly never, I, I, I'm too old now to be as good as Wakefield was, huh? Here's another one. You know, it was interesting going through the book this morning in preparation for you all just to, I'm, I'm overdue to reread that book again. I've read it two or three times already. And this is, they say pulling a boat. And there you go. There's a man pulling. Well, you know, you could pull, this is in Honesdale. So the, the canal um, started navigation in the town of Honesdale, Pennsylvania. And uh, let's see if I can get rid of the glare again there, or most of it. And this is a scene from, from the big basin they had there. This is where the gravity railroad terminated. And there, indeed, you've got the gravity railroad cars right there. Um, those cars would actually just dump the coal directly into the, uh, in, into the canal boats. And, uh, but polling was, for, for most of the time, as we understand it, you could be fined with either 5 or $10 if you were caught polling your boat. Anybody have any idea why? Give you a second out there. This is what I miss about uh, when I do presentations. It's great to have an audience to ask questions, which is why I, I, I always encourage you. Um, <clears throat> yeah, the reason you weren't allowed to pull your boat was because as they built the canal, they would fill it and drain it multiple times, trying to get the bed to settle completely. Uh, and in some instances, like the summit level between Cutterback Mill and Ellenville, it wouldn't hold water, and they had to resort to what they call... Um, what they call puddling, lining it with clay, like people do with uh, uh, in, in uh, um, dumps and stuff today. You know, they'll put a clay lining so nothing leaches out. Um, but they, the, much of the, the canal was lined with a clay puddling. And I, I'm told that burrowing am, animals were a constant problem. In fact, the DNH actually had watchmen whose sole job was to walk along the towing path and look for signs of burrowing animal. No doubt he'd have a gun. There to shoot the, the burrowing animals. Uh, they had problems with eels. They had problems with uh, um, gophers and the like, groundhogs. It's also said, we know from, from Russell Farnham Lord's uh, letters, that they could tell where they had slight leaks because the vegetation would do much better. And this guy would go and he'd repair it if he could. And after about, oh, 1846 or 47, I don't know the exact year, he could telegraph if it was a bigger problem. They could send a telegraph down from one of the telegraph offices uh, and get a repair crew. And the repair crews could actually use a steam launch where the other ones couldn't. But here's this wonderful scene. I've just always, when you think about the meticulous detailing on these, uh, how long did it must have taken them to do these? But these are some wonderful, wonderful uh, prints. Now here's one. You can open up, those of you at home, if you've got your copy of uh, Coal Boats to Tidewater, you can go to page 60. I've got a print right over that. Page 60, because that's where this is. This is the double locks in Honesdale. Um, this way they could have a boat coming in each direction <coughs> or, um, or actually just speed it up by having more than one boat um, being raised or lowered in the locks. That's probably some of the gravity uh, works over there because this is still in Honesdale. You know, if you go to the town of Honesdale today, unfortunately, none of this is there. Um, there's open spaces and you can see where the railroad came through later, but, uh, but there's not much left. This happened in a lot of the towns um, that, uh, that the, the, the canal remains, um, didn't remain, if you will. The canal remains were, were filled in after the canal period. Whereas out in the country, why I can go out and do Where Is Our Historian is there's still a decent amount of uh, remains that you can walk today. Um, coming up sometime this month, it was supposed to be tomorrow, but we've gotten a re repri reprieve. Um, we are be debuting our new website designed by our ex my excellent co-director down in Atlanta, Georgia, um, Kayla Altland. 
Uh, and one of the things that'll be on this website, there'll be links to all of this video and our Facebook page and Instagram, but there'll be a Google map that's got all of the publicly accessible parts of the DNH on it. Uh, it's got spots where you can legally park and where you can public, where the public is allowed to go and view the DNH remains. It'll be a work in progress. I've been working on it off and on for a couple of years. It had been something that the DHTHC had been wanting uh, to get done. And we'll be, I'll, I'll, maybe I'll even have a special, where's our, or, or excuse me, Sunday afternoon when we actually debut that. But I think it'll be a, um, besides something that I'll be working on the rest of my life, it's a wonderful excuse to study these 1854 maps that, in fact, Wake himself had. Next week, I think uh, we'll go over just Wake's maps, if you'd like. In fact, if any of you live in any of the canal towns and would like to see any of the excellent individual town maps he's made, let us know via Facebook and I'll make sure to feature them. I don't know that I'll have time to see all of them here. But there you go, the only double locks on the DNH. Um, and that's side by side. They talked about double locking other spots, but that never did occur here. Um, the Erie Canal had a famous in Lockport. They had, it, it wasn't double locks. It was, I think, five locks, but it was five locks in a row, like staircases. The problem with that kind of stuff is, boy, you need a lot of water. The Erie, for the most part, didn't need so many locks. 363 miles, 85 locks. I think uh, uh, about a quarter of them were between Schenectady and... Um, and Water Elite, where it met the Hudson. In fact, travelers of the day would take the stagecoach or the train to Schenectady and get on the Erie just to avoid those locks. Boning up on my Erie stuff because I'll be on the site uh, the week after next. And here we go. This one's properly matted. It, there was nothing quite to see. This is the Lackawaxen Aqueduct. You know, it's funny, I'm doing this from memory now. Uh, there were two, yeah, no, this is definitely the, the, the Lackawaxen. Oh, no, excuse me, this is not the Lackawaxen. This is absolutely, definitely the Cuddybackville one. I'm sorry, my wits are a wool gathering, as they say. Um, there were only, there were four suspension aqueducts. These were designed by John Augustus Roebling, um, some of the earliest suspension, uh, um, well, amongst the earliest suspension uh, bridges and aqueducts in American history. Uh, he did a f four of them, one over the Lackawaxen, which has a single, had a single pier. All that's left of that one now is one side. One over the Delaware that's multi-piered, and we'll get a look at that one, I believe, a little later to today. Will we? No, no, we won't. Never mind. Um, <laughs> you'd think I'd be better prepared, but there you go. Uh, so, and then there was one over the canal, or excuse me, over the Roundhouse Creek here in High Falls that was a single stretch. This is the one that was over the Neversink River. And if you go to the excellent um, Neversink area, Neversink Valley Area Museum of Technology and Innovation. Did I get that right, Judy? Um, yes, thank you. Neversink Aqueduct. Um, this replaced one that was designed by John Jervis. I know you're a big John Jervis fan there, Judy. As am I. That could be a hole. Whole, he only worked for the DNH for five or six years, and yet you could still talk a great deal about uh, John Jervis. Yes, this is the Neversink Aqueduct, and today I was just there a couple weeks ago shooting some Where's Our Historian. You can see both of the uh, both of the abutments are still there, although they tell me they're starting to see signs of some stone going. Hopefully, they can get somebody to take care of that. Over the Neversink River, this replaced a wooden trunk aqueduct that wasn't a suspension one. Uh, and this would, these were all done in the final enlargement. Oh, both sides of the Jervis are present. You know, Judy, you're absolutely right because I saw one of them when I was there. I'll have to go there with you when we can, Judy. Um, I can't find any of the ones here in High Falls. There's really no sign or hardly any. Um, but I did, uh, I did on the uh, north end go all the way up and then history and innovation. Thank you, Judy. I knew I'd get it wrong. <laughs> Um, so much to remember. <clears throat> and as you get older, folks, by the way, boy. Yeah, so this is a wonderful, uh, uh, wonderful scratch board. Oops, I'm going to start causing me some trouble here if I'm not careful. Yeah, we'll raise you on up. What else do I have to show you here, huh? So these were mounted, and because they're They've got a proper airspace. 
I've kept them mounted for now. It actually keeps them safer than the boxes. <clears throat> um, but many of them, the show that we did, my goodness, how many years ago was it now? Probably 2013, 2014. Um, I, I felt it was important to show people the unmatted uh, if there was information. So on, you'll see on the next one as well, on the next couple, um, the notes that were attached either as the captions. And this is uh, the <clears throat> narrows of the Lackawaxen. On the Lackawaxen Creek, this is a section where they had to hug the, the, the stonework. Is it the narrows? Yeah, the narrows of the Lackawaxen. Yes, Chester, uh, um, when we can finally take off our masks, or maybe even if we all want to go with our masks on and stay six feet apart, uh, a, a trip to a trip to Cutterbackville with Judy and Stephen Sky and some of those great folks down there would be a, a really wonderful idea. We should figure something out there. Um, sometimes people know things I didn't know. I, 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 Jody, I'm, uh, we have photos of both aqueducts coexisting. I don't know that I've seen that one recently. You know, I, I haven't dug into Manville's drawer and scanned. I've, I've come across, I just recently came across a photo that I now know is Eddieville, like you've never seen it. Um, and I know it because it was in our Manville Wakefield drawer. You know, maybe someday I'll just sit by the drawer and pull stuff out and show it to you. You know, if there's anything that you know we have and you wanna see, um, let me know. You know, I'm here every Sunday afternoon at two o'clock. I might shift that at some point. But at the moment, I'm still trying to give you a half hour or 45 minutes of my time and show you some of the wonderful treasures we have. It's an excuse for me to go dig into our, uh, our archives a little more. This was especially um, fun for me uh, because I had a real problem when I went to hang the show that these were fam framed for. So speaking of both the Jervis, I don't know whether this aqueduct was, you know, Judy, you and I have uh, discussed this on Facebook, whether the stone aqueduct in High Falls that they built was designed by John Jervis or not. Um, it was built in the very first year, if memory serves, um, and, but Jervis was engaged. He wasn't the chief engineer yet. He doesn't become the chief engineer until the... June of 26 or 27, I'm, 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 I'm blanking on the dates. I don't know, you could probably read this. It says R17, that's part of the placement from original line drawing by MB Wakefield. Yes, yeah, so the, these are the notes for what, you can see he signed it in the corner there. The two High Falls crossings shown in this line illustration, the Pioneer Twin Arch Bridge built in 1826 and the Roebling Suspension Span commenced in 1849. Uh, and you can see he was telling Alan to get as much in the, the page 23 as possible. Crop mokes, bar, yeah, so there you get the, the, the notes to the, uh, is it the compositor? Or I guess the compositor does the uh, type, no, typesetter. Yeah, uh, interesting the questions you ask while you're talking with no script, huh? <laughs> but there we've got, uh, it's a shame, you know, the, the, uh, the stone one in the background there on the, on the uh, western side um, was extant until 1956 when the power company that's now CH Energy destroyed it, claiming that the, the previous year's flood had undermined it. But I was fortunate enough to have one of the local uh, old timers, if you will. I'm getting to be an old timer myself. Um, but somebody who lived here his whole life. I'm a newcomer. I've only been here since 95. Um, he, he assured me that it was really just liability concerns. They, they, uh, they tried to use a wrecking ball on it, but because it was built with the great natural local cement, um, it kind of bounced right off and they had to use copious amounts of, of um, munitions, TNT probably, uh, to destroy what had been a public amenity. It was used as a footbridge. Throughout the 20th century, I've spoken to people, uh, Winnie Williams, may she rest in peace, was, uh, initiated our Sunday flea market that benefits the Canal Society many, many moons ago. And um, she, she told me how she would uh, cross over to the other side of the round out on it uh, as a child even uh, at the earliest time. Um, but after 1856, she was a gone. Meanwhile, the lining to the Roebling Aqueduct burned in, I believe, 1914. And that was holding water. They were sending boats across it the, the canal closes down in 1898, but it actually continues from Wurtsboro 
for another couple years, and probably by about 1902, um, none of this is watered, but just this side, just north, um, holds water until at least 1916, probably 1917. In fact, the lock tender for lock 16, George Swizzer, um, continued operating locks. He operated four locks, so he crossed over and operated the locks on the other side uh, of the Roundout Creek. Um, uh, the N-word locks, as we say, because they were referred to in a pejorative for people of color, um, presumably because the lock tenders were people of color, and I posit that it was the wrong side of the town. There wasn't a lot going on. All of the industrial activity and stuff was over here. Over on that side was, uh, was more rural. <clears throat> yes, uh, there's definitely photographs. I don't know about a print, Judy, but uh, we've got photographs in our collection of this structure burning back in uh, 1914. Probably made the press at that point. Chester, I always appreciate you there, uh, giving people other things to look at. Fortunately, they're not looking at me today, so at least we save them that, you know? Let's see here, so. But when I was laying out the show back a few years back, I was really distressed to open up the boxes that these were stored in. Sorry about the shake there, people. Because this print was missing. Uh, couldn't find it anywhere. I was really, really, really upset because as many of you know, this is the Depew Tavern. I read somewhere it was called the Stonehouse Tavern when Simeon Depew operated it. Um, I've got to find that primary source. I know I read it somewhere. Had to be one of the 19th century histories. Um, the Depew Canal House, as, it, as uh, John Novi dubbed it when he had his four-star restaurant uh, um, there from, I guess it was uh, 1968 or 69 till 2015. He was serving food there until just before we purchased the house on December 1st of 2015. Open Space Institute, New York State Department of Parks, Recreation and Historic Preservation um, granted us $800,000 and purchased us the house. And we are now um, fundraising and doing restoration. We've put a new roof. We've put on, well, Interestingly enough, Wake didn't put on the North Edition that sat right here. That's an interesting, if you've seen other pictures of this, there's a, uh, and if you live in the area and see, we just replaced it. There's a, a North, there's an entranceway right here. And it sits on a stone wall that was actually predated the structure. The stone wall actually is, looks better on the inside than the outside. The stone wall was the retaining wall for the dirt ramp to the various bridges that were here. This is a late view because it has a, what I call a Squire Whipple bridge. This is an iron bridge designed by one of the earliest graduates of the Union College uh, um, Civil Engineering Program in the uh, 1840s. Uh, and they were designed for the Erie, but were used on all the canals of the era. We have photographs of this building with a wooden pony truss bridge. Um, a covered bridge, believe it or not. The walkway wasn't covered. The trusses were, and the D&H had probably had over a hundred um, covered bridges, many of them unknown to the Society for the Preservation of Covered Bridges. And uh, one of my many side projects is uh, to do a catalog of them all and to write an article on it with Ron Knapp, who's written already two books on covered bridges, as well as a wonderful book uh, uh, on um, the Shoengum region there. Near Mingo Park. Hmm. Mingo Park. Yeah, I'm, I, I'm not sure, Judy. Things to look up. But, um, but as I, the, the story about this particular etching, it went missing. But unfortunately, in one of the many boxes, in the archival boxes where we store things, was a note. And so I knew that in 2003, it was used in a, a seasonal show on the museum in High Falls. I've been looking for that darn thing. But uh, just yesterday, I was crawling into the deepest recesses of the crawl space uh, behind the map in the center of our museum and found in a box of what I thought was just materials for a show. It was mainly discarded pieces of, of foam core and the like. I rediscovered this. So I'm really, really happy. This was on my list of things to rediscover. How sad would it be if we had lost Manville Wakefield's line art drawing of our new home? Um, but here it is. Uh, I framed it up for you folks here, but it'll, it'll get out from under glass uh, um, later today and be put back where we all know it'll be. 
But uh, Manville Wakefield, an amazing man. I'm sorry, I would love to get his oil painting of the canal. Sullivan County Community College, if you're ever looking to get, you know, Sullivan, uh, just an interesting side note, you Sullivan County folk. When I was there because of that show, they had beautiful wall mural that was done by Manville Wakefield and some other people. And they were in the midst of talking about taking it down. And I hope to God they didn't do it. Um, it's not, it's sort of outside my area of, you know, I don't get there often enough. It would be a shame. And I hope if they did take it down that they would conserve it somehow as opposed to painting over it. Um, it's on their walls. It's original. It, as I say, it's not just Manville Wakefield, but he did some of them as well. Um, but uh, stay tuned. Join me next week. I think next week all I'll do is talk about, we'll go over the maps that he did and maybe talk about some of the things we found. And uh, maybe I can tell you about some of the wonderful stuff I've discovered um, while studying those wonderful 1854 maps. You know, so I'd like to come over here and say goodbye, everybody. Thanks for joining me. If you didn't see this now, you can see it later. But then I have to run over here and say See you all soon.